Welcome to the No Life Jackets podcast. As you can see, I've brought in a token female for the first time, all right? It's not just it's not just me and my white guy friends, all right? It's also me and my white woman friends. So, we're <laughs> we're going to get rolling here. Um I'm your host Brian, uh and I've got uh with me uh my friend Becca, um hopefully to talk about some writing stuff um and whatnot. But uh but Becca, you want to give us like a quick uh cliff notes uh, introduction of what's kind of who you are, what you do, what you like, you know? I mean, as far as, uh, what I do, I am currently unemployed, so there's that, <laughs> but yeah, I just, uh, quit teaching after three years, just moved back to Iowa from Southwest Utah, and now I am working on my book and working to get my blog relaunched and essentially just chasing the dream for now <laughs> nice i dig it i dig it that's awesome so i was actually i was actually curious and i think i had these somewhere here in topic so this is as good a place to start as any but so you so was your you got your bachelor's when you graduated college and was that in teaching then yeah i got my bachelor's well it's technically a bachelor's of arts but i got it in secondary and middle level education Oh, gotcha. Cool beans. And then it was a kind of like, I imagine it was, there probably was like a short list of people who were looking for teachers on in some program or something. And that's how you got shipped over to Utah. Yeah, they actually, so they send out a list sort of starting the fall of your senior year of schools that are looking for teachers. And then you can kind of send out your resume. It's kind of their updated version of the call process because technically via the call process, schools are just supposed to contact you but they've up updated now so that you send them their resume first and i guess you kind of nudge the holy spirit in their direction <laughs> is the uh, thought process interesting but, yeah, so they, up they even call it a Utah. call nice <laughs> exactly yeah so nice I against that. against my will i ended up in utah but <laughs> it was it was a great place to be nice i dig it so you were in, so you're in South, in Southwest Utah. Let me think. So you're, yeah. So you're in the really like hot part of Utah down there, right? Like just a yep. straight desert. Yep. Down in the desert. Nice. That's cool. Did you, did you, uh, now that you've lived both places, do you, uh, do you, can you kind of enjoy like the desert life or do you still prefer having some cold in your life? <laughs> you know, I enjoyed the desert a lot in the winter but it was not worth it. Now, given I never spent a full summer out there because I was lucky enough to be able to come back to the Midwest. But even the month of August, we had, so all of our recesses were outside. And when it's 115 degrees out, it's miserable. You know, they say, oh, it's a dry heat. It's not so bad. It doesn't matter at that point. It was atrocious. So I would take the Midwest heat and humidity and the Midwest winters any day over that August gotcha i could i could definitely i could definitely see that um i got some friends who are who are looking to move move down to completely escape the snow but i don't know i feel like there's such like a thin line where it's like between absolutely scorching heat just murdering you in the summer and still having like a decent winter like there's such a thin belt across the country and you gotta yeah. really hit it <laughs> awesome all right, so it was a so that was so it was also the school you were teaching at was it was like a Lutheran school situation, right? Correct. Gotcha. Cool. And what grades did you teach there? I taught fifth, sixth, and seventh grade, and I had them yeah. for everything. Ooh, holy balls! My goodness, you had them right in like, I think. Oh, what is? Oh, uh, what is? What is? Uh, what does my father-in-law say about that? He says. Uh, he says that there's like a range of ages where ch where kids cease to be human, right? He's, he's a science teacher, right? But he's in high school, loves that. He was, he would never do middle school. There's a there's a gap there. He just wants to you know, send them all off to Siberia to be educated for those three years because they're so terrible. <laughs> yeah, no, there. But the best part is is if you are like me and you maintain the maturity and the mindset of a middle schooler, you blend with them great. <laughs> 
I could see that. I could see that. I've only, I feel like, particularly with fifth and sixth grade teachers, in my experience, like, I, like the teachers that I, I've had growing up, there, there's a whole spectrum of you know how they behave and how nice they are versus how strict they are. But every like, when I think back to every fifth or sixth grade teacher I've ever met, it's always been on one of the extremes, right? Like it was just yeah. running it like it's a, like it's a military academy or you're way at the other end just being the ultimate pushover and waiting until they feel sorry for you or something. I don't know, but <laughs> it's an interesting grade. Nice. Yeah. All right. Let me see here. Bum, ba -dum, bum, 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 bum. All right. So speaking of where you were living, sort of, I'm, cu I'm curious, do you, do you think you're more of a city person? Or like, a, or like a country person, right? Like, if you had to choose, which one are you feeling more? You know, you know, for the longest time, I would have said city. I mean, I was definitely that kid growing up that's like, I'm going to move to New York City and, mm -hmm. you know, live in a tiny apartment and public transport and all this, and it's going to be great. But then I lived in a big city. I mean, St. George... It doesn't feel like a big city because you can't have any buildings taller than the temple. Mm -hmm. So there's no skyscrapers or anything. So if you look at it, it looks, you know, like a smaller town that just goes on forever. But dealing with the traffic there and just dealing with the constant noise and, you know, the paranoia of, you know, is someone going to mug me when I'm out walking mm -hmm. at night? Things like that. I would choose living in the middle of nowhere in a heartbeat. You know, I as long as I still have access, I could still go visit the big cities, things like that. But mm -hmm. I don't think I could live there long term. Gotcha. Okay, that's what you mean. I think, I think I'm pr I'm probably there with you, but I think I want to I want to go to like a real metropolis for a bit first. Like I've never like the only like massive city that I've ever really been to was like D.C. on our <laughs> senior trip. <laughs> and that, like, I love the train and everything, right? But every other big city that I've, like, been to for any period of time was, like, the kind of recent big city where it's just a middle-sized city, but it just kept growing, right? I want to get to, like, mm -hmm. a metropolis, right, where there's there's subways built in underneath and all of this. Like, I don't know. I feel like maybe I'd, I'd like the extreme better than that kind of terrible Dallas-Fort Worth middle ground, you know? Yeah, that's fair. No, you... You should definitely go check out New York, especially go around Christmas time. It's there's a ton of people there, and it's a hot mess, but it's so great. Nice. I'll have to I'll have to give that one a try. I know uh, Debbie's brother went there a little bit ago, but we haven't uh, we haven't been there ourselves. So I might have to do it. I might have to do it for. Uh, um, I think maybe at some point in my life I want to try a cannonball run. So it's when you start in New York and you try to get you try to drive to LA as fast as possible, right? So it's, it's like, oh, nice. yeah, it's, so it's completely illegal. It's like, it's like sort of based off of a movie, which was based off of the first time they actually tried this in real life in the seventies, but people track the records, right? They're like getting on it. And these people like, they'll be setting their crews at 130 miles an hour. Just Holy crap. <laughs> get across. Yeah. So it's, it's highly, it's highly illegal, but you know, maybe when I'm, so it's like, <laughs> like me trying to get back to school on time after media. <laughs> yeah yeah that was what we were training for oh how did i never think to do time attacks for media class oh my goodness <laughs> timing and going for my personal best oh that would have been so dumb and now i'm too responsible i, mean, you think, to I think you may have had it that time that uh we the rest of us got stuck in the road construction at the end of the driveway and you just ramped it you're right. You're right. I, I would have. That was a. Uh, I had the biggest lead time right there. I think that's true. That's <laughs> true. <laughs> Dang it! The things I should have thought of when I was still stupider. No, you know what? You know, life isn't a straight line. I could get that stupid again. We'll we'll wait it out. We'll wait it out. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let me see. I think I had another one. Oh yeah. So um. I didn't have this one technically on the list, but uh, a Utah-related thing, like you mentioned, like not being able to build buildings that were taller than the temple, for example. And I know I had like some distant, distant family who lived down there in Mormon country. And they said like, as mm -hmm. like random Christians in the area, they, it was like impossible for them to make any friends. Like, did you have any like yep. experiences like that? Yeah, it's very interesting 
uh, interacting with people in the LDS community, as, as I'm sure there probably is this great variety in the Christian community, but, you know, I met, I had some really great friends that were LDS uh, from, but they were, you know, the ones in theater, they're the ones in improv, mm -hmm. which I feel like by the time you're doing theater and improv, you're a little bit more centralized, you know, on the scale anyway, you're not going to be extreme. Well, if you're centralized or, you know, drifting left yeah um but sure. they're not that extreme extreme right that a lot of ldsers are and so i did encounter some that especially even hearing about it from my students where growing up they'd have these friends and then their friends as parents would find out that they themselves were not a part of the lds church and they would tell their kids no you can't play with that person anymore you don't talk to that person oh anymore. my goodness and it just i was like what like it that's bananas Holy but heck. i guess yeah. that's you know yeah dang that's a bit a bit different it's not and it's not like it's not like you grew up in a family that was you know you know like like a hippy dippy elca milk toast kind of lutheran all right <laughs> you're out there on the front lines all right yeah like, yeah that's that's an interesting one because yeah i mean even coming from like a cons like a conservative side of like lutheranism you know we grew up at the schools we went to like yeah i just i can't i can't imagine anybody ha having done something like that but i suppose you know we do live in such a majority christian area growing up that it probably wasn't yeah. that big a deal yeah hmm. yeah well and that's the thing like i can't imagine my dad ever being like oh you can't play with so and so they're not a lutheran <laughs> like, <laughs> like oh my gosh that would have been the most effective way for him to actually like push you into a friend group I'm think if I'm thinking back, I'm thinking like if your if your dad told you like, hey, you don't get to hang out with these people, I think uh, I think they would have been your besties straight up. <laughs> yeah, I would have been like, absolutely. Yeah, I'll hang out with them. Sure, <laughs> I have I have severe problems with authority. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Interesting. When we actually, uh, I was a little curious on that because we just watched the, the Netflix documentary on the FLDS. There's like a mini. A oh, mini I want to watch that. Yeah, dude, it's so good and so freaky. Like, holy mackerel. Although it brings up some really interesting things. Because I remember growing up, because it was a big story when I was really young, like when I discovered that things on TV were real, you know? And it was like, mm -hmm. there was, there's a bunch of, there's a bunch of little girls that are being used as currency for these old men, but they're te but technically this is just how they live. So can you take them from their parents? It was a whole weird thing. And like, yeah, I completely had almost forgotten about it, but what a weird, a weird thing. Yeah. Well, and I don't know how the documentary approaches it, but I was reading an article a few weeks ago, and it was talking about how, oh, this was a culture of the past, and they don't, they don't continue that anymore. But I've been, I cannot think of the name of the town right now for the life of me. Oh, yeah. But um... I've been to whatever that town is down there by the Utah-Arizona border. Mm -hmm. And you drive through, and you still, like, that that community is still there. I mean, yeah. for example, you drive through, you see all the, uh, the houses that don't have the roofs finished on it because technically they can avoid, they can't be taxed on their houses until their <laughs> house is complete. Oh. And if the roof isn't done, it's not complete. Um, one right there. But you can drive through and you see all the, their big blocks of house, all their little communes there. Interesting. And, like, yeah. I don't know why that article is like, yeah, they're definitely. Like the I'm like, so nothing. Yeah, because what they got him with, what they ended up get, getting like the the main leader with, was because he conducted weddings uh, with underage brides, and so they ended up getting him mm -hmm. like just for the underage thing. And I think he's still in prison today, but he's been actively leading the church from prison, and like they had yep. footage of some of the calls because it's public. Where, like, a family will come in, you know, still dressed like they're pioneers in 1842 or whatever. Yeah. And, you go and... to Walmart and you can see them. <laughs> you just see them walking around it's, Walmart. It's so, can, yeah, it was mind-blowing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You can always tell the FLDS and the polygamists because they, they dress very distinctly. It's very similar to, you know, in Minnesota and Wisconsin when you can see the Amish or mm. the Mennonites. Um, that style of dress is very similar, but the women have, I'm sorry, it's the weirdest hairstyle. It's like this big, loose, like, braid thing. It's the ugliest hairstyle ever. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, you can always tell. I went to a concert 
the beginning of last school year, just this symphony that played just outside of uh, Bryce National Park. Oh, yep. And there was, on our bus, the shuttle bus going up there, there were these two really big polygamous families on there with us. And I was like, oh, yeah. hello. Okay. Like, it was so interesting. Yeah, they were because they, they're showing, like, yeah, you could have, like, they were past, they'd have, like, documents that they'd found, like, pamphlets, like, hey, these are the, these are the six accepted hairstyles you can have in the community. They had, like, footage from, like, their children's school play of, like, you know, little girls saying, keep sweet and obey. And, oh, my God. Yeah. It was it was blowing my mind a little bit. But, um, yeah, it was, it, it's something. That documentary is really good. <laughs> yeah. Well, I suppose, yeah, I like, I can't it. imagine a bad one with that good of, that good of content. Like. <laughs> right? Yeah. Holy crap. Oh. All right. Let me, let me, let, let's move here a little bit. Let me go. Bum, 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 bum. Uh, oh, yeah. So uh, teaching college sort of related to some of that. I'm curious. Uh, what, was, what was your kind of like college deciding process coming out of Martin Luther? Because mine was terrible. And so I've been asking like other people what theirs was. <laughs> mine was like, I wasn't interested in any of that at all. I just wanted to live in the moment and play bass and pep band. That's what I was going to do. And my mom made me visit like two places. And that was how how I rolled it, but did you, uh, did you have an experience with more thought put into it? <laughs> Actually, my mom also made me visit the college I ended up going to, so I don't <laughs> know, maybe there's something to that, because it was junior year, and I was down there for my brother's wedding, and I said, like, I had been saying since third grade that I was not going to go to Seward, Nebraska for college, and then she set up a visit without me knowing it, and she woke me up that morning, and was like, Good morning, Dad's gonna drive you over for a college tour. It's like what? But even <laughs> at that point, I was thinking, oh, I'm gonna go to college for business. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what I wanted to do with that business degree, but I was certain I was gonna go for business. And then it was was it sometime that summer, or it must have been. I ended up changing to education, and I think the big factor in it is I kind of try to do the whole like picture your life, you know. Eight mm -hmm. years from now or so, what do you see yourself doing? And I was like, you know, I'd be great living the corporate life and just like going with the rush of things and, you know, that. But I was like, you know, I really want to teach high school English. And so I went into college thinking I was going to get a degree in secondary education for English language, language arts. But then fall of my freshman year, they put us in some classrooms, you know, just for observation and I had two observations I did one in a high school and one in a middle school and those high schoolers they were just well one I felt like they were as old as I was which they were so that freaked me out I was like I can't teach them I am them and then two they were just dead they were zombies they did not give a crap about being there I was like I can't do this and then I went and I watched the middle school room and they were so alive in that and I really clicked with the middle level advisor at Concordia. I did not click well with the secondary level advisor. Mm -hmm. but that's a different story for another time. <laughs> um, and so I switched. They actually that year started offering the option to do. Usually you had to pick between middle level and secondary. Well, they just started the option of saying you can get a degree in secondary education and one of your endorsements can be in middle level education. So you can kind of get both. So I switched to that and then ended up being driven toward, you know, I really wanted to do middle level education. Nice. I dig it. That, that's an interesting one. Yeah. I'm thinking, I'm thinking back and I think for a while I wanted to be a teacher. I mean, I'd be, a, I don't know. I don't think, I'd, I think I'd probably be a pretty terrible teacher. Um, but <laughs> I think, I think it was probably seventh and eighth grade just because I like Mr. Wachholz that much. I know you probably don't yeah. share that sentiment. I've heard a couple of times, <laughs> but, uh, Yep. No, no, no. I, re I respect <laughs> him overall. We butted heads over a lot of things, but mm -hmm. now that I am a teacher or that I was a teacher, I respect him because I liked that he still let me voice my opinion. You mm -hmm. know, I ran into <clears throat> a certain teacher in high school that very much so was just like, shut up. This is what it is. You know, don't talk back, mm -hmm. whatnot. Yeah. Um, but at least Mr. Wackles would let me argue with him. So even though we didn't see eye to eye, there was kind of that, like, okay, you know. Yeah, for that, sure. I, I respected him, even though I didn't agree with him. 
Yeah, yeah. He was. I think he was. I mean, it might just be because of the grades he was teaching, seventh and eighth. But he was kind of the first teacher I had that I felt like really just like treated the kids like people mostly. You know, mm-hmm. maybe because you know the seventh and eighth grade they're probably getting close, but but uh, we're getting close to real people. <laughs> yeah, they're almost there. Crap. <laughs> Do you remember that time he threw you out of the classroom? Um, oh, it was when Alex's dad died. Yes, and you were singing "Highway to Hell." Oh my gosh, this is one of my oh, I I wake up in cold sweats thinking about this, Becca. Okay, like it's... this is like one of those deep regrets I think about before falling asleep sometimes. <laughs> oh my god. Oh. He did not get mad often, but when he did, holy cow. I can't, I still am, I cannot believe that I screamed in his face in front of the class about him not having a backbone in that because I was so ticked off about group tests. And he took it calmly, no reaction. And the, when did he explode on me? It was when he stepped out of the room and the radio was on behind his desk. Mm. Mm-hmm. And. I still remember it was um, the one song by Paramore that You Are the Only Exception came on. And everyone in the class was like, oh, we hate this song. So I was like, I'll go change the station. <laughs> and I stepped behind his desk to go change the radio station. And he walked into the room. And that's when he blew up on me. Mm-hmm. Not when I was screaming in his face, but because I was behind his desk. I was like, what? What? Yeah, this is this, this is actually inter- interesting because I, I was thinking about this this the other day sort of like when you have like an authority figure like any kind right so your your parents your teachers I don't know, even politicians right you like you're constantly like you're keeping track of what they have of your experiences with them right and so you you have mm-hmm. like you can look over like these months of your experience and you'll be looking for the inconsistencies in their behavior right. But I'm never going to treat myself that way, right? I'm not treating anyone else on my level in my group like that. <laughs> you know, I'm not, I'm not keeping track of my stuff and being like, man, this is really inconsistent of me. Like two months ago, I said this and now like, mm, not getting it. But when it's like an authority figure, you're keeping, you're keeping that track right along. Mm. Oh, yeah. Well, and especially middle schoolers, they will remind you if you are not consistent about something, which, you know, I remember... I wanted to be, one of my big goals heading into teaching was to be consistent. Mm -hmm. And because of that, there's kind of this domino effect. My first couple months of teaching, once I sent the first kid to the principal's office, honestly, within the first three weeks, I think there were maybe 12 or 13 different times that someone got sent to the principal's office. So I was like, no, I need to be consistent, you know? That's a tough, that's a tough one. Yeah. And it it worked. The kids, you know, were like, oh, we're not going to. No, we're not going to mess with her but my principal was like okay maybe maybe be a little less consistent <laughs> i got emails i need to write becca all right yeah. <laughs> i dig it okay nice all right well since we're already talking a little bit about uh about growing up here one of the, this is a lot like a chunk of a lot of the questions i like to do is like kind of focus on like like i'm really curious like how people became who they are so I usually ask some questions about growing up and stuff. So let me start. This one's probably usually, usually my favorite. Let's see. What was the what was the most formative time or event in your life so far? So I've thought about this, and I I think it comes back to three different times, but they all fall under the same umbrella. I gotcha. I gotcha. Yeah. And it was actually. The three different times that I was in my worst depressive episodes. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> and I think it's because then I had to pull myself out of it. You know, I had to do the work mm-hmm. to, you know. I mean, yeah, you can't always just pull yourself up by your bootstraps and be like, All right, I'm fine now. But you, there is a lot of work that goes into getting yourself back out of those situations. And so, you know, my uh, freshman year of high school, I didn't know it at the time. Like, I didn't have the words to, you know, Mm -hmm. describe what I was going through. But as I look back, I'm like, yeah, I was severely depressed. There was all sorts of things going on, all sorts of pressures that, honestly, I was putting on myself. Um, But I I remember that winter, there was, was it influenza B? Is that a thing? going around really bad and like people were getting hospitalized or whatnot. And I remember I hit a point where I got the flu 
And I was out for like a week and a half from school. I was so sick. And I hit the point where I was like, I don't even want to get back. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I do not care. But what the good that came from it was I hit that point and I dove into the only comfort I had from the confines of my bed, which was my computer going online or whatnot. And I found an online Harry Potter uh, community group. And I ended up as a an admin on a couple of different Harry Potter Facebook pages. Mm -hmm. And that opened the door for me to do a lot of writing with them. I wrote a lot of fan fiction. I wrote a lot of head cannons. And I ended up writing this like 35 chapter fan fiction. And I had people like begging for the next chapter. I didn't even <laughs> written the next chapter yet. I had no clue where I was going with this thing. I was winging it. <laughs> but it was such a great time for my writing because I was like, oh, wow, people actually give a crap about what I'm writing about, mm -hmm. you know? And so that was extremely formative because I learned, you know, one, how to push through those crappy, crappy times. Two, I learned, okay, I could do this writing thing if I wanted to. And, you know, I learned that, okay, well, that was a crappy time and now it's better. I, you know, I got out of it. Mm -hmm. And then, um, the next one would have been the summer of 2017. Ironically, the summer I met Ben, um, who is now my husband. Um, but that was just, that was a whole, it was a mess. And my mental health was shot. And it was a, a lot of, it was the summer where I finally, it was that big coming of age summer where mm -hmm. I really had to think about, okay, am I going to be the person I want to be or the person everyone expects me to be because I realized they were two vastly different people and it was a lot of hard work choosing and being like okay no I need to be you know who I am and it sounds so cliche this is like every <laughs> YA novel ever yeah um, yep. there's a reason you know but yeah, <laughs> yeah but that was you know extremely formative because I finally started saying no I'm gonna you know stand on my own two feet and lost a few people from my life because of that and you know mm -hmm. had to get through that all that and then even you know the third time this last school year you know learning to walk away from people that are still good people in places that are still good places mm -hmm. and you know learning how to cope with that and yeah so Apparently, I just, I grow the most <laughs> during my depressive episodes. Yeah, there, I mean, yeah, there's, def there's definitely something, something to be said for that. That's, like, I think, I think that's pretty common. Like, I think almost everybody I've asked, I've asked that question. It's, it's, it's been something similar to that. Cole had a, had a, had a depressive time. And, like, he, even mine, like, I think, I usually think about, like, I don't know, sixth and seventh grade, and then maybe a little bit early high school, but. Yeah, I I was de I was definitely very very de very depressed back then, and you know you pick you pick up the things that help you get out of it, um, and stuff like that. So it's uh I think that's pretty common. That's a lot of it. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, and it's so it's so interesting now. I'm curious as to if I were a middle schooler now, and nothing else was different except for the fact that I was a middle schooler in 2022 instead of you know 2010. Mm -hmm how things would have been different because i feel like we just we talk about it more now you know yeah yeah i think i think able, i think you're right like, yeah i'm able to look at my parents now and be like yeah so uh i have depression you know <laughs> and it's a normal conversation it's not mm -hmm. like a you know oh we you know hush hush you know people go oh, we don't talk about this and so it's i don't know i'm mm -hmm. thankful it played out the way it did because you know yeah i don't yeah Definitely. Yeah, for sure. But yeah, I think particularly like um like your experience with uh being sick for that time and being depressed and like finding like writing in particular to kind of help get you out of mm -hmm. it. Like I think that's huge cuz when I was when I was depressed uh in like 6th and 7th grade, um like my thing was my thing like I had it in my head that uh that I wasn't good at anything, right? Because you know, I, I, I was shorter and smaller and less coordinated than everybody else my whole life, oh, right? No. And so <laughs> I was in my head like, <laughs> made fun of you for it too. <laughs> and so, 
And so I was like, man, I'm just not good at any of these other things. I know what's what my thing is going to be. My thing is going to be not doing things, right? And so like, <laughs> like I remember specifically, I think it was sixth grade year. I, I like... I, like uh, like before I was before I got homeschooled for part of that year, but uh, I like didn't join didn't join the basketball team not because I didn't want to join the basketball team but because I was like ah this will ruin my image. <laughs> 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 they'll think they'll, they'll start thinking I'm I'm the guy who does things and then all this work goes <laughs> away you know. Um, yeah. <laughs> and you committed to it. You just you didn't even do actual school. Like, exactly. I, I, I really had to move around. But, but yeah, and part of that uh, that came out of that was just like finding, I'm like, okay, you know, people like people who do cool things. I'm like, okay, well, you know what? I, I got to shift this around. This ain't working. So I had to pick up some actual hobbies and things to do. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let me find, I'm out here. let's get into some of the writing questions since this popped up here. So, so was that like a lot of like uh, your first writing experiences was the fanfic and the head cannons or um, what, what was kind of like some of the early, earliest stuff you remember of like getting into writing? So I actually, the first thing I ever clearly remember writing was actually the summer before first grade. Uh, my brothers had told me that in order to get into the first grade, you either had to spell, I can't remember what word it was, but it was some long, complicated word, or you had to write an essay, which they, I asked them about it now, and they deny that they ever, they <laughs> said, oh, no, we just said you had to spell the word. We never said the essay thing. But I remember them saying that second option because I was so worried that I would crack under pressure on the spot and not be able to spell this word, <laughs> that I wrote this essay on Mount Everest. And I remember, like, I had the encyclopedias out, and I was doing all this. So that was the first, like, lengthy thing I remember writing. But story-wise, I think my story writing started to take off more in around third grade. Um, I have actually, at my parents' house, they have a few of the stories that I wrote, you know, in class, mm -hmm. you know, for classwork there. And there's one of them that, like, not to brag about my third grade self, but I'm like, this is actually a really good story concept. What the heck? Mm -hmm. And I remember that was the age where I was like, I had, my aunt had given me this um, accordion binder, but it was a Hilary Duff accordion binder. Oh, baby. And I would keep my stories in there. And I had them organized and I had my story ideas organized in there. And that was when I started telling people, you know, this is what I'm going to do for a living. I'm going to be an author. I'm going to write books. You know, and nice. obviously, you know, we got lost on the way there as people okay. were like, okay, Coming but back here's around. the real world. <laughs> here's the real world. You know, you need to have an actual job. And mm. so, which, you know, they're not wrong, yeah. but, but yeah, so that was one of my earliest experiences. And that was kind of when I started writing. Nice. I dig it. I think. The earliest stuff I remember, I think, is probably right around there, like first or second grade, somewhere around. And I have, oh, actually, my my grandparents, uh, they passed recently. We cleared out uh, their house, and they had an old folder where they had uh, some of this crap that I'd, like, typed up on their computer, and then they'd print it off and filed away. And it was all, like, you know, like, kids, like, go to readings. So they're like, oh, well, we need to get them some bigger books, right? And everybody gets them Nancy Drew and Hardy Boys, right? And so that was that mm -hmm. was all the stuff I was reading at the time. So I wrote these glorious knockoffs. I was trying to like find one so that I, I could I could read it because they're hilarious. Um, but it's just it's just so much fun to see like the because it's, it's it's like literally just you can tell it was like watching other stuff and like oh I can almost see the faint outline of how that plot structure should work and then attempting something very similar um, in a horrifying fashion right so like you know the scene yeah. where they're like oh, I don't know what to do next. And then they look around in their environment and they see something and they're like, aha, got it, right? That version, one of the stories was there's like robbers going into a bank and these two girls are like, oh my gosh, what should we do? And they see trash on the curb and they're like, I know. And so they trap them in trash bags. And uh, that's, how they, that's how they take care of the bad guys. Yeah, I actually, I have, so I went through a big Narnia obsession phase. I'd mm. always loved like the old movies as a kid, but then when the newer remakes started Ooh. coming out, I was like, absolutely. And I have, I think it was from third grade, a knockoff of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe that I wrote. And I thought it was like, I thought I was 
fooling everyone. I thought no one's going to see the similarities here. I can't even remember the title, but it was definitely three things. It was like the the blank, the blank, and the blank. Mm-hmm. And it's it's like a direct knockoff of the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Yep, a hundred percent. That I mean, that's that's just how you get how you got to start writing. Like, there is no way any anyone ever pops off. Like, you know, even you know, like the real prodigies, like you know, how like I don't know, Christopher Paolini. He was super young, right? Nothing in mm-hmm. Aragon's new territory. Okay, you know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he, he's just doing what we did, but better. That bastard. Mm. <laughs> Gotcha. So, uh, let's see. What uh, what type of writing do you generally do nowadays, like genre-wise or stuff like that? Like, what interests you? I do a lot of young adult fiction. Mm-hmm. You know, I aim for more novel-length things. I, you know, I'll dabble in poetry and short stories, but, like, my poetry and my short stories are always, they're just dark. I gotcha. Like, it's, mm-hmm. I don't write a lot of happy poetry or a lot of happy short stories. And my novels, they, yeah, they have darker aspects, but they at least, you know, have some lighter mm-hmm. moments in it. And I, I don't know, I have one right now, the longest one that I'm working on. It's it's based on a true story, so it's more of that realistic fiction. Mm-hmm. Um, but I do have a couple of stories planned out. And in fact, I have the first few chapters of another book that's more fantasy realm based. Gotcha. Or even more... I don't know, not historical fiction per se, but more, you know, set in yeah, set in sure. history, but not, I, I don't want to do the research to do historical fiction. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I'm right there with you. Like, I don't, I, I don't know. I'm not a, I'm not a huge researcher like that when I do stuff. Um, and I think, hmm, that's, this is, this is partially, uh, this is partially why I end up mostly writing short stories actually, um, is because when I start writing something longer, just the amount of time that, that goes into it, I, uh, what I'll do is I'll be so worried about like making the story make sense. Right. Mm-hmm. Whereas if I like a short story, right, I'm cranking this thing out in a few, in a few sessions, right. You know, pretty, pretty done. I'm not worried about it needing to make sense. It's a short story. Nobody expects that. Right. But whenever I start doing it, I'll write, I'll write something. I'll be like, Oh, but this doesn't quite make sense. And I'll be like trying to puzzle piece the plot so that there's never a plot hole. Because for some mm-hmm. reason, if I'm writing something longer, it can't be whimsical and have all the holes in it like all my other stories do. So, I don't know. <laughs> it's a bit, of, it's a bit of a weird one. But yeah, I'm not, yeah. Much, I'm not much of a researcher for sure. <laughs> yeah, that's that's the nice thing too about writing, you know, pure fiction or pure fantasy is you can build your own worlds, mm-hmm. and it doesn't, you know, have to. The big thing is I've learned from watching people critique some of the more famous fantasy authors is you just can't. You cannot set the standard that this happened while our world as we know it was also happening. Yeah. Because then they're just going to nitpick and tear it apart and be like, well, but this and this. There was, I read a post like a long time ago about there's some word that uh, is used in the Lord of the Rings in Middle Earth. And someone was critiquing and being like, well, they couldn't have used this word because the etymology traces back to, you know, the 1800s. And this is taking place before then. And so they couldn't have used this word. I'm like, why? Who cares? Oh, what? It's so, it's so frustrating. Yeah, it's like, it's, I feel like it's like the, like the criticism you'll get, like, particularly if you're doing like, um, like high fantasy, right? Where, you know, it's all world building, right? But you'll get mm-hmm. in trouble because these people they're they're searching for it, and you can't. It's very hard to do something Forrest Gumpish, right? You know, Forrest Gump. Like the whole point is like, hey, this is history, but this guy was totally there. They don't like manufacture a story in between it. It's so hard to do that for some genres. Like, uh, mm-hmm. you gotta set your expectations real early if you're gonna be if you're gonna be doing something like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and I think that's why dystopian novels got so popular, because I think authors were just like, fine, I can't write about the past without you critiquing it. I'm going to write about what happens after all of you are exploded. <laughs> Heck yeah. Oh, that's, a, that's such a, wow, you know, you know, that's probably a good point. Because, like, it's, like, you, you want usually want your books to at least be internally consistent. You know, like, this book's mm-hmm. rules make sense in this book, which isn't too difficult. And then if you do a multiple book series... It's like, oh, I gotta make the entire series consistent. Yeah, it's probably not, probably not gonna happen. 
depending on who you are, if you don't have like a whole wiki and a team helping you track continuity, but like, yeah, it's just, there's so much to keep track of, especially if you're like, oh, well, now it needs to make sense with actual history and what happened here that mm. mm -hmm. yeah. if you're doing any sort of large scale story, it gets tough. You can do small scale stuff pretty well. You know, like a lot of those, like, like the classic Regency romance where it's like, yeah, this mm -hmm. is, this may or may not be in this time period. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I, I think anytime it's a Regency, people just go, oh, yeah, the Victorian era, even though it's, like, not yeah. the Victorian era at all. But, like, people aren't going to do the research. They just are like, yeah, you know, mm -hmm. whatever. Oh, Debbie gets so mad about this because she's she's really into historical fashion, right? So she, know, she mm -hmm. knows all this stuff and how stuff is supposed to work. And she loves watching Regency. But she'll just be sitting there and she'll we'll be watching and she'll be tearing these, these shows apart for their fashion. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm like, Debbie, I don't think, like, I don't know, this just seems so tertiary to the experience to me, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let me roll. Let's see here. Oh, yeah, here's, here's a fun one. I'm actually interested. Hmm. Actually, I, I'm going to, I'll tell you the question, and I'm going to guess what your answer is. All right, we'll see, we'll see, okay. we'll see if I'm right. All right, so the question is if whether you're not, you're an architect or a gardener when you write. And so, like, the architect, you know, you're like, you're like planning stuff out. You got lists of all your characters and your plot points and you're, you're ready to go. You know how your story is going to end and how it's going to go through. Right. Whereas the gardener is just like, Hey, I put, I, I know what, I know how it starts and I put the characters in the world and I water them regularly with conflict and hope something happens. Right. I'm going to guess, Oh, this is such a tough one. I'm going to guess. I don't know. I actually think you might be an architect. What do you think? No, oh. I am a gardener through and through. I'll have, you know, spurts where I'm like, oh, hey, this quote is going to be really great when this happens later. And I'll jot down that quote and save it for later. Or maybe I'll say, oh, eventually I want this to come around. But mm -hmm. for the most part, I just sit down. So my shorter work in progress the one that i only have like i think i have like ten thousand words on it right now i actually the first night i sat down to work on it it's an idea the opening scene i've had like in my head i think i actually wrote a version of it back when i was in like fourth fifth grade somewhere but it's on paper it's who mm -hmm. knows where it is um but i sat down and i wrote the first six thousand words of that book in one sitting and I had no clue where I was going with it. I just sat and I just let, you know, I kind of, yeah, I put the characters there, like you said, and I water them every so often with some conflict and I just let them do their thing nice. and a story comes out of it. Gotcha. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. I'm de I'm def I'm definitely a gardener as well. Like I really, like when I was, I'd say probably like seventh or eighth grade when I was trying to write some stuff. I very rarely ever got too far into it because I'd start planning, right? So I had like a, I had like a folder mm -hmm. on my desk where I'd like write these little bios for the characters that I had in it. And uh, and I kind of like graphed out where I want the plot to be. I was like writing down scenes and putting them in outlines and whatnot. But the problem is as soon as I do that, the story dies, right? I feel like I've... Mm -hmm. Like, I feel like I already wrote it. <laughs> exactly. I'll, I'll sit down and I'll exactly. be like, man, I, I already know this is going to happen. What a lame story. <laughs> well, and that's where, so back when I was writing that really long fan fiction, you know, I'd write a chapter and I'd post it or whatnot because people breathing down my neck, like, oh, we want to know what happens next. And it would, it was my biggest pet peeve is when people would sit in the comments and predict what was happening next because I didn't know what happened next. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, well, I, my biggest fear was that I was going to finish a chapter and have this vague idea in my head of what happened next. And someone was going to comment and be like, this Ooh. is what happens next. And then I would be like, now I can't use it because then I feel like I'm just, you know, mm -hmm. ripping them off or whatnot. And that's where I think if, if I ever do a longer series, like, you know, with JK Rowling and Harry Potter, mm -hmm. I think I would almost want to have all of the books written before I publish the first one. Yeah. Because that way, too, I mean, speaking of plot holes, I feel like as a gardener, you're really setting yourself up <laughs> for plot holes. A hundred percent. Because there's there's no planning. 
Like, yeah, yeah, I def I definitely agree with you. This is actually this is probably another another major reason why I write short stories because I write I write whack shit. All right, like none of my like <laughs> nothing nothing that I manage to finish writing is like a normal story because I because if I do start writing a normal story, I'll be like oh. But then I could subvert it this way and do the opposite of what the people are expecting, right? <laughs> and so I like to yeah. start from a really whack shit idea. And so, like the first collection of short stories that I'm trying that I'm trying to write is old ones. Uh, they're, sto they're short stories where the characters know they're in a book, right? They mm. know they're mm -hmm. in a story or how things work out, and like you know how that interaction works out is different for every story, but. Um, but just starting with that, I'm like, <laughs> it doesn't matter if there's plot holes. That just means this author was bad. Not me. Checkmate. <laughs> <laughs> Got him. <laughs> yeah. Yep. That's where, you know, wait, no. No, I just lost my whole train of thought. Give me one second. <laughs> no worries. Holes. Oh, that's where one of my big things I want to do, you know, with my novels is take you know, speaking of flipping things on their heads is, you know, take your standard, you know, YA fiction stereotype and, mm -hmm. you know, add in some things that I feel like kids need to see more of, you know, mm -hmm. obviously there's always the big talk of diversity and whatnot. And I feel like that often is around like, oh, you know, we should have characters of different races that are actually written well, you know, not mm -hmm. <clears throat> Cho Chang <laughs> at J.K. Rowling. Um, and so, yeah, I want to show more of that, but even more, you know, with disabilities or mm -hmm. even different struggles with mental illness. You know, one of my goals is to write a novel where you have the hero break, which we see a lot of, but often we see the hero break and they're told, okay, well, keep pushing. You have to keep pushing. But what if they didn't keep pushing? What if they did get sent home while the rest of the team kept pushing? Mm -hmm. You know, what happens then? And so, yeah, I also, I really, but my biggest fear is that people are always going to be like, oh, it's this author. She just, she's always trying to do this random crap and like mm -hmm. act like she's so cool because she's doing that. And I'm like, oh no, I just, I need to not worry about what people think about the books I haven't written yet. <laughs> You're, I, I, got, the big thing. I gotcha. The big, the big anxiety of the hypothetical audience that may finish the hypothetical book that you may hypothetically write. I feel you. Exactly. I feel you. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. There's um my fa my favorite author um Brandon Sanderson has been do has been doing a lot of this in uh, some of his recent books and it's uh in his major fantasy series um the Stormlight Archive like actually one of the like one of the main characters is like he has depression right his character arc isn't like you know related to the depression or anything he's just a main one of the main characters with depression. <laughs> It kind of yeah. It 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 definitely throws in some inter some interesting ways because it's like you still because you still like as an author you generally you'd still want to have like kind of the same up and down kind of structure you know you know defeat mm -hmm. followed by triumph and that sort of thing right you just might change what some of those things are you know and as long as it's still you know written and explained in a satisfying way I think it can work really well so yeah I think you're yeah. on a good track there. Yeah, I'll have to I'll have to check out his books because I I like that because that's the other thing we see too is so many of this like oh maybe they had depression but you know through this series of events poof it's magically gone woohoo <laughs> like that's not how this works yeah that's not how any yeah of this the story yeah the storyline for depression so many times is like man but then I discovered baking and I'm no longer yeah. depressed or like even exactly. when. Uh, like I remember, even like growing up, like you, uh, I remember at uh, in high school one time they brought in a police officer to talk about his alcoholism, mm -hmm. and he was and he was like trying to do that. He's like, yeah, I mean, still I'm an alcoholic, and I was like, wait a minute, what? I thought <laughs> I thought you were over that, man. Okay, like <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's not this finite thing. Yeah, it's <laughs> yeah, it's an interesting one for sure. I think it can still be written pretty well, but it definitely, like, you know, like, uh, for example, you know, like when you're writing, when we're writing stuff when you're younger, right, you can't just copy the the trope over and slap it in. You got to think about it a little bit for sure. That's fun. That's awesome. Exactly. Exactly. Well, and it's interesting, too, 
you know, because there are some books already out there that talk about the tougher issues, but they're often on the banned book list because parents are like, oh, well, this is this is too dark for our kids to handle. Mm -hmm. And I hope more and more parents are opening their eyes and realizing like, oh, our kids are already dealing with this stuff, you know, whether or not they read about it in their book. Yeah, there's a lot. That's the, that's gotta be the most frustrating thing, particularly with books and like school and stuff like that. It'll be like, ah, there's a sex scene in this book, or they'll be talking about like, oh, they talk about using drugs in this book. It's like, well, yeah, but if you read the book, the entire point yeah. is that maybe that's not a good coping mechanism. <laughs> exactly. But they get, well, I remember, yeah. where was it? There was somewhere that was talking about they were banning the book "Speak" by Laurie. Halsey Anderson or Halsey Anderson, one of the two, right? Mm -hmm. And they're like, yeah, because it talks about sex. Well, the whole point of the book, spoiler alert, is that (laughs) she got raped and it's how she's dealing and healing, you know, with, you know, what happened. So yeah, the book talks about (laughs) sex, but that's not the point of the book. It's, I don't know. Yeah, it's such, it's such a weird one. Like, I don't know. People get the, get like, a book written about something mixed up with a book that's telling you to do something. It, I don't know. Yeah. It, it's it's so dumb. I remember actually this this is like super surprising in in hindsight. But the library um, at Martin Luther, the library at Martin Luther, that one shelf of books along the back of the English room. So a lot of mm-hmm. the, a lot of those books, none of the teachers or anyone had ever actually looked at. Right? They like you know at the rummage sale or something, and they'll shove them on there. And I remember I grabbed one book. It's called A Thief's Primer. Right, and I was a bit of a kleptomaniac when I was a kid, right? So I was like, yeah, you know, right? So I pick, I pick the book up, and I'm reading this thing, and it's a count from a criminal. Uh, it was like some reporter like is transcribing this guy's experiences down while he's in prison from being a mobs, a mobster in the 30s, <laughs> and. Like, it's constantly like, yeah, I mean, we go out, we commit a crime to get some money, you know, then we go out on the town and we'd get some cock, you know, we'd run and because apparently that was what they'd, they'd call like going and getting a prostitute, right? They weren't going and getting some pussy. No, they were going out to get some cock, right? That's what, that's what they'd say. And the entire book is just like him talking about, yeah, you know, I, like, I, I really like this one girl one time. And he's like getting all this graphic detail of how he, his scheme was set up so that he'd get the money and then he'd go spend it all and all of this terrible book, right? No, no, like, no, like, Actually, I gotta say, I, I love the book, but you know, like, it doesn't feel like a very a book that uh, that a Lutheran high school would have on its little shelf. And I remember I put it back, yeah. and she's and she's like, "Oh, how'd you like that book? I never read it." And I'm like, uh, "Yeah, I like it. It's pretty good. Pretty good. <laughs> it's, it's great. You should read it with the class." No. Well, and that's the goofy thing too. Even so, at the school I was at, I couldn't even have the Harry Potter books in my classroom library. Ooh, and that's. Like, I am not a fan of censor- censorship on mm-hmm. any level, but especially, I'm like, what? Like, it's not like these, I, I don't know. I respect parents' choices for their kids, mm-hmm. but also, I'm like, no kid is going to think, ah, oh, yes, let me grab my broom and jump off of the roof because I read this in this fictional book. Yeah, I don't, yeah. Like, the Harry Potter stuff for some of those, like, uber-Christian families and stuff, like, ban their kids from doing that or watching Spongebob. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, you know, I guess you, I guess you do you, but that's, that's a weird one to me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What? All right. Let me see here. All right. Now, now we're going to, now we're going to get down, get down here and the, the main struggle that writers have, Becca. Okay. The main struggle that writers have to get everything ready. You want to, you want to write, you're in it, you're in it, you sit down and you just can't write. Have you have you figured out any good ways for yourself to uh, to motivate you to you to write and push through any writer's block or some strategies? Yeah. So, well, I actually experienced writer's block, believe it or not, for the first time this spring. My goodness, nice. And it it sent me spiraling. So usually I just don't have like there's definitely times where I should be writing and I don't mainly mm-hmm. because I'm terrible with deadlines. Like, if there's not a firm deadline, it's not going to get done. Um, but as far as pushing through writer's block, one of the things that kind of helped get the ball rolling again, uh, I you know, I looked into your general advice, and one of the big things that kept coming up is, okay, well, if you can't write your stories, then just start journaling. Write about what happened, mm-hmm. you know, that day. And it worked out well because at the time, 
I was working on my wedding gift for Ben, which was just a series of letters of, you know, kind of what happened Mm -hmm. over the course of our engagement since we were long distance anyway. Um, And so that got me into the habit of journaling every day and just writing down. It didn't have to be anything fancy. There was no pressure to describe things in this great pithy way that people would marvel at for years to come. But it started getting words out of me again. And that kind of helped, you know, there's some author that has this quote that said something about like, you know, sometimes you just turn the tap on and, you know, yeah, there's rust coming out with the water Mm -hmm. for a while, but then it clears out. And that ended up being true is that the more I journaled, the easier it was, you know, I started having those creative thoughts jump out at me again. And, you know, the other thing I noticed too, whenever I'm stuck and I'm like, okay, what do I want to do next with this? I just go out, go for a walk and just let my mind wander. You know, one of the things I like to do when I walk is create stories around the setting that I'm walking in. So when I was out in St. George and you're walking on this creepy path at dusk and you're wondering if someone's going to jump out and bug you, you know, yep, that lends itself to some great stories. Or when I'm down by my parents, they have this huge flood wall down by the Ohio River and there's this path that walks right by it. And whenever I walk on that path, there's no one else around. It feels like, you know, the start of like the Hunger Games where you're walking by this like mm. huge wall that you can't <laughs> cross. And, like, no one else is around, so are you supposed to be out? And that helps sparks a lot of ideas, too. But for me personally, who needs that structure, needs that deadline, that's why I really like... November's always my big writing month, because I do NaNoWriMo. I have two NaNoWriMos under my belt, and they have been a blessing, because, you know, you have this hard deadline. Mm-hmm. By the end of the month, you need to have so many words written, which which means you should be aiming for so many words a day, and that, you know keeps me accountable and keeps me writing and I always hit like November 20th and I'm like yeah I'm making so much progress in my book I'm just gonna keep if I keep writing at this rate I last November I remember I posted on Facebook and I was like yeah anyone that wants beta read this book for me it'll be ready in like January or February (laughs) (laughs) I haven't worked on it since last November (laughs) I got gotcha. you. Because I, there was no longer a pressure. Well, there was other things going on at the time with my own brain. But yeah, there was no longer a pressure or deadline. So I stopped working on it. And so. Yeah. I gotcha. I can, de- I, can de- I can definitely see that. That makes that makes a lot of sense. Like um, whenever I've done something longer form, it's it's been hard to give myself a, a deadline. I think I might have to give National Novel Writing Month a try. I think I might have to, might have to try that this November and see how many words. Highly recommend. Out. Gotcha. It's really nice. They have a lot of, so both years I worked on the same book, right? And mm-hmm. I like it because, you know, the rule is you write it, you don't go back and revise it, you know, which I don't do anyway because I just, you know, mm-hmm. I like to plow through it. And then once the whole story is done, I'll go back and, you mm-hmm. know, edit and revise or whatnot. But I like it because then you really can't waste time thinking about, oh, what if I did this differently? You just keep plowing forward. But they have so many great resources for you starting in September and October, where if you're starting a brand new book, they have so many great like world building resources and resources for helping you lay out your characters and, you know, deciding what your major plot points are going to be. So if you want to be more of an architect with it, they have a good support system for that. Nice. I like it. Yeah, I think I'm a, I think I might have to give give that a try. I've got a couple ideas that I just don't think are for a short story. Um and so I've been hesitating to like keep writing on them because I'm like if I keep writing on this one I'm going to have to plan something out and then the story's going to die. <laughs> yeah. Mhm. Nice. All right. Let me see what other writing topics did I have in here here. Oh, yeah. So I was curious. Uh, when you write a story, do you have a particular goal in it? Um, like, I know, like, a lot like a lot of, um, you know, YA stuff can oftentimes be, like, around learning a specific lesson or, you know, like, relating to a specific life event a lot of people have in common or something like that. But, uh, but what do you have? Hmm. Mm-hmm. So there's this other quote by this author I don't remember the name of that talks about you know write the book you want to read Mm. and so my big goal in writing is kind of twofold one I 
I want to write the book that my younger self needed to read. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to write the book, again, that shows those struggles, that puts the words in their mouth to be able to go to a trusted adult and say, hey, you know, I think that this is something I'm struggling with. I see myself in this character, you know, and showing them, you know, how to ask for help, how to approach that instead of just the, you know, push through and, <laughs> you know, I mean, sometimes, yeah, you do push through, but, mm -hmm. but you can push through with support. And so, you know, that's one of my big goals and kind of the second one kind of goes hand in hand into it. Oftentimes I write to help myself heal from stuff. Mm -hmm. And so my big novel that I'm working on now, again, based on a true story, it's the story of the summer of 2017 and everything that went into it and everything that came after. And, you know, it, ironically, I was talking to, I think it was Ben a few weeks ago. And I was like, I don't even want to write this story anymore, though, because I have healed from the events in it. So what's the point <laughs> of finishing it? And he was like, you have put it's this story is like a hundred and twenty thousand words long currently or something like that it's gonna be a massive book yeah and he was like you've put too much work into it to stop now like you need to just just finish the book mm -hmm. you know and so that you know so now for that book i'm focusing on goal number one because goal number two is accomplished gotcha i, nice. I healed via the writing and so yeah so it's kind of that teaching the lesson but just you know I guess teaching very specific lessons on, yeah. Mm -hmm. Awesome, I dig it. Yeah, with the usually with the with the whack shit I write, uh, it's like I don't know. Like I wanna like my goal is usually to like just like I wanna make something that nobody else would have ever thought to make usually right mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. like whether it's it's doing something super duper weird like i have one story and i, I it, it's like the way that this works is, is kind of clunky but it like so it's, it's that same like meta concept where the character knows they're in a story but the story starts off and it feels like it's in third person but then the author walks in through a door and you realize that it's just been them in first person talking about Ooh. this world the whole time nice it's super nice. Cl it, like i got i think i gotta i, I might have to iron it out a little bit because it, it feels a little clunky <laughs> the switch but it's like i mean because the character is an author their first person is really everybody else's third person omniscient it it, it gets it gets really mm -hmm. weird so just well, some weird stuff like that that's what i used to go yeah with. I, I love stories and books like that where you get to like the end or you get towards the end and something happens and you go, wait, wait, what? And you go back mm -hmm. and you have to read the whole thing. Like, I don't know if you've read a series of unfortunate events all the way through, mm -hmm. but if you haven't, you need to because, and I'm telling you now, you're going to read the whole thing and then you're going to want to go back and read it a second time. Gotcha. I'll have it's to get so that good. on my list. Let me write that down here before I... I forget. I think I remember when I was really little. I was. Uh, I tried reading the first one, but I think I was too young for it. I don't think my uh, my reading was quite quite up to that level yet. I never gave it another try, so I'll have to try that one again. There we go. Awesome. I like that. I like that. Yeah. And what? Uh. Oh, I thought I had something else. Where was it? I pulled it from. I need to try to pull it from the ether. Let's see. It was. Oh, I like, I really, you're talking about um, the story you're writing and kind of like in the process of writing it, it, it like helped you heal a little bit. And I did that accidentally with one of my stories. Like I was writing it like, oh, this is so cool. It's like such a fun, a fun little, little thing to write. It was uh, probably, I think the, be the best one I've, I've written. So best thing I've written so far was a uh, disco rumble. I might've sent you the file for it, but, uh, but disco yeah, rumble. Yeah, you asked me like seven months ago to take a look at it and i have half of it done i have half of it with notes on it and i haven't gotten the other half done no worries no worries <laughs> but but yeah so I, I wrote that and i got to the end i'm like wait a minute brian did you just okay never mind you know what yeah and so uh, i like yeah I, I i realized i needed to make a make make a make a job change at the end of, at the end of that book i was like hmm 
snuck it snuck it on yourself there brian didn't you <laughs> yeah mm-hmm. well uh-huh. and i think readers can tell when authors have those moments i think it it translates so well you know because there's definitely times i've read books and they're just putting words down for the sake of putting words down and there's nothing more behind it and it's awful mm-hmm. and i think you, the best writing comes from those authors that are really you know they're going through something and it's their escape definitely for sure i mean harry potter jk rowling was in severe depression mm-hmm. and she started writing that and i mean look at where it got her <laughs> the center of a lot of controversy sure but very very rich very very well known Mm-hmm. yeah for sure it's it's really like that like you know i mean there's a reason for like that stereotype of of the the depressed starving artist the world doesn't yeah. understand me right it's <laughs> <laughs> it, there's a reason for it. It uh, can lead to a lot of uh, a lot of really interesting stuff. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. All right, let me see here. Blue, blue, blue. Okay, we got that one done. Um, yeah. Oh, so you kind of mentioned it when you're starting up. So given you're currently unemployed, you know that's why you're scraping the bottom of the barrel on this piece of shit podcast. Uh, you know. Your 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 uh, your incoming career shift here uh, with writing and your blog and whatnot. Like, what's uh, what's kind of your goal with your writing? Like, do you ever think you'll be like a full career novelist, or is that kind of like something that you'd uh, that you like to aim for? Yeah, I mean, that's I think that's always the dream. I don't know. It's always been my dream. Like I said, you know, from third mm-hmm. grade on, I was telling people I'm going to be an author. And so I always thought it was the coolest thing. I escaped into books a lot as a kid, especially around middle school when I had all sorts of stuff happening. And as you know, there was so much drama going on in middle school. <laughs> oh, and yeah. so I escaped into books. And, you know, when I write, it really is my own little world. I get into the zone, you know, and it's just such a fulfilling thing to do with my time. So if I could get paid to do that and that was my job, 100%, like that would be the goal. I just, I don't ever want to sell out though and just be writing books for the sake of a paycheck. Mm -hmm. You know, one of my biggest fears is I'm going to be told, hey, you need to write this or you need to add this type of content to your book in order for it to sell. Mm -hmm. The other problem is I never respond well to uh, critiques of my writing And it's not like the, oh, I think they're, it's not like I break down and sob, but it's more of, even in college, I would have professors be like, oh, I would recommend changing this about your story. And I'm like, I'm sorry, you're wrong. I'm a one draft wonder. Thank you. (laughs) It's perfect as it is. Mm -hmm. And so I think that'll be something though, if I want a career in writing that I really have to learn that just because I think it's perfect the way it is, other people are like, there's this one short story I wrote last school year. Because I have my students do a lot of, this is actually another way I get myself to write. If I'm not in a writing mode, I have my students write. And then while they write, I'm like, I always tell them, well, hey, if I'm making you write, I'll make myself write. Mm -hmm. And so I have all sorts of different prompts I give them or different writing games we play. And there's a story I wrote that came from that that I think is genius. And I think it ties into this secretive title so well. And I've had like four or five different people read it and they're like, I don't get it. It doesn't make sense. I'm like, no, it does make sense. You're all just idiots. <laughs> but, but yeah, so I would, I would love to do it, you know, full time. I would love even, mm-hmm. you know, even if I would actually be consistent with getting my blog posted, you know, doing that more consistently. But I think either way, even if it doesn't, turn into this career like i'm not writing to be famous i'm writing to write yeah you know so i think i'll write either way but yeah it'd be nice if it'd be nice if i could get some side benefits from it heck yeah i'm gonna do it anyway nice i dig it that's fantastic but yeah like like when you you mentioned that short story and you're like like ah this makes perfect sense it's so good right because it's like i've i've done this before i right? like i write, i'll write something and like for this really niche part of my brain i'm like ah oh, this is so fantastic the only problem is you'll only get it if you know javascript 
you know, like, mm-hmm. <laughs> like yeah. it's something so small and I'm like, yeah, clearly nobody's going to actually read this, right? I mean, good for me, but, you know. <laughs> yeah. I like it. All right, let me see here. Here we go. So what, who or uh, what would you say are some of your biggest influences, like uh, like writing style or content-wise? can be some authors or some series or um, just some concepts or something like that. Yeah, I would say, you know, I have to give credit where credit is due to J.K. Rowling. Mm-hmm. You know, I know, again, she's the center of a lot of controversy and whatnot. But mm-hmm. I think that, like, for me, I set that aside because of, what she did for me oh, yeah. in her books you know and you know in middle school where again there was a lot of drama um my friendships were always rocky often because of my own doing i will be the first <laughs> to admit um i you know there's a lot of drama did i cause a lot of it yeah um <laughs> But one of the main consistencies is that was when I started reading the Harry Potter books. In fact, I went to, I started going to the library after school with um, Tina, you know, mm-hmm. from grade, a grade above us. Yeah. And she recommended the books to me. And it was, it was amazing. I was like, oh, what the heck? And I it was able to escape into that little world. And again, then it opened that door freshman year of high school, you know, gave me that community you know, that place of that sense of belonging, I guess, that middle schoolers and high schoolers are always looking for. And so J.K. Rowling was definitely a big influence. Um, uh, C.S. Lewis, you know, Narnia from a young age, too, Mm -hmm. always blew my mind. I love, I love the allegory stuff. I would love to write an allegorical novel. In fact, I have a novel idea. It's not mine. It's Ben's idea, but he doesn't want to write the novel, so he has Mm -hmm. given me the go-ahead to write this novel for him. But it's very allegorical and very biblically based and whatnot, and, you know, that, I have to give credit to C.S. Lewis there. Mm -hmm. Um, Lemony Snicket, you know, I love, I love how he breaks the fourth wall in his books, the whole... You know, he'll be like, oh, and so, dear reader, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. And there's, I have some short stories from when I was a kid where I was trying to do the same thing. Like, like I'd be like, don't fret, dear reader, for things will turn out fine. <laughs> um, and yeah, and I, I would say then also then John Green and uh, Laurie, I don't know if it's Halls or Halsey, I think it's Halls. Laurie mm-hmm. Halls Anderson, because they very much so are two of the more prominent ones that I know of that write about mental illness and write about trauma Mm -hmm. and whatnot and so you know i want to kind of take all of those authors and just put them in a blender not the physical (laughs) authors i want to take the way they write and put it in a blender and mix it together and then that would be yeah i like it but yeah often you know i write about either my life experiences are like what my ideal life would be. Cause I, that's the other thing too, is I like to put myself in the shoes of one of the characters. Again. Okay. What would I want? How would I want this to work? Definitely. Be? Yeah. I, so. I, I feel you. It's a lot like the problem I have is that I'll, I'll like, like this is, this usually ends up being for, lo- for longer stuff and short stories. Usually I can remove myself far enough from the story concept. Right. But whenever I do a novel, I'm, I like, even if like a character, right. I'll like write them. And then as I keep writing, I'll come back and be like, oh, dang, this character is a bit like me, isn't it? And it ruins it for me. I feel like I've cheated. I feel yeah. I feel like I've inserted a well, Mary Sue, and so now I have to shit on this character. <laughs> exactly. And that's, you know, I, I've i seen a lot of authors get flack for that. And mm-hmm. that's my another, like, paranoia of mine is like, oh, no. Like, that's, <laughs> but that's what I do. <laughs> Yeah, I haven't figured out how to write this this short story yet, but it's happened so so many times that I want to write, and it it's a totally normal book, right? Except one of these characters is Mary Sue, and you don't know which one it is, and they know they're the Mary Sue, so they're trying to trick you. <laughs> I like it. I like it. It's like a reality show, but in a book. Yeah, yeah, just like these these. This, Totally weird concept. I hadn't figured out how to format that one to make it work yet, but I have that written down in my notes. <laughs> uh, that's a good. One. Oh, and you mentioned um, like some of the stories when you were when you were young. You'd have like those like fourth wall breaking moments. 
Mm-hmm. I, w- I found this journal from when I was in second and third grade. And I, I like a lot of it, I'd just be writing just like dumb stuff. But some of them were stories. And I'd, I, I like start writing a story and I get to a point and it would be like, if you want, if you want to, if you want me to keep writing, please insert 50 cents to continue. Dot, dot, dot. And just fade. <laughs> like <laughs> all these stupid little things just like that that would keep happening. And I'm like, mm, this motherfucker. <laughs> hey, that would work really well as like an ebook. Like that would be pretty sense good. <laughs> to continue reading. Microtransactions, the novel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I dig it. I dig it. All right. Let me see here. I think I had. Do 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 do. Oh, I got. I got to stop doing these questions out of order. I forget where uh, which ones I didn't do yet. Let's see. I got that one. Got that one. Sweet. I think we got. Good. All right. Awesome. So now what What I want to do, Becca, I want that hook that I sent over to you. So there's this hook. I think maybe I'll try linking it somewhere in the podcast notes so people could actually look at it. I'll have to figure out how to do that, but I'll try to get it there. But it's basically, I had this, I just had this random concept in my head because like, you know, people, they commute, right? doing the same routine every morning, everybody's looking at their phones, right? I'm like, ah, these people commuting are like zombies, right? And then I'm like, wait a minute, what if they actually were zombies, right? So there's zombies on the subways, and that's kind of where this hook came from, and I really like the hook, Um, but it's one of these things where I think it's going to have to be a longer form something, Um, Mm -hmm. and so I haven't haven't continued up with it. But I sent it over for your thoughts, uh, so I'm I'm, I'm curious what you think uh, on this. Yeah. I, I am definitely hooked. I want to read the rest of the story once you have it. <laughs> I'll be honest, I first started reading it, and you know, where you're talking about how <laughs> people just go through the motions and they just get on the subway, whatever. I was like, okay, yeah, we know this. Like, is this just going to be one of those <laughs> things that, you know, one of those cliches that's repeated? And then when they turned out to be actual zombies, I was like, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I think it's really cool. I'm intrigued to see, you know, you have the one person alive on there, Mm, mm -hmm. you know, on the train or whatnot. And so I'm I'm (laughs) interested to see, you know, how, uh, what's the main character's name? Uh, I think Abigail. Abigail, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I'm curious to see, you know, well, and why is Abigail interested in this? And so I think... It's such a good hook because you've set up, you've, in, in just the beginning, you've taken an idea that people have heard a million times and turned it on its head. You've set up the intrigue of, okay, who is this person alive? You set up the intrigue of why does, why, why are people just ignoring the fact that there's literal zombies on the subway? Mm-hmm. And then also the, okay, well, why does Abigail give a crap about it? Definitely. You know? And okay. so it's, yeah, you've set up a lot of those, like, the intrigue of the, okay, wait a minute, there's, like, four or five questions that we need answers to. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay, I was ho- I was hoping that would work, because usually, like, writing short stories, I usually don't have to necessarily lay a hook, right, because it's just the whole the whole story. Mm-hmm. But I was hoping um, that that's kind of how, how it would feel. It's got a, um, like, the, like, it's got, a, like, a, got an interesting vibe but i'm not sure how i how exactly i'll carry forward if i do a full length thing because since i'm so used to writing short stories um like you can get away with having like a very different mood or vibe or something or i don't know how to describe <laughs> it necessarily this one's got a very i don't even i don't know how to, how to describe it like the, in the like the like the narrative voice it's kind of it's kind of like plain and carried out i don't know it almost feels very gray i don't know how to describe it but and i don't think if i'm doing a whole story that i could necessarily keep maintain that same like uh tone maybe that's the word for it tone yeah Um, but i think i think it's set up for i think the events that could follow would help add color to the tone gotcha yeah Yeah, because there's seems to be a lot of good substance there to to dig through gotcha all right, awesome. Well, I'm glad I'm glad the hook does its job. Now I'll just have to figure it out. I think the direction it would go, I think the novel would end up being a what's it called? Uh, urban fantasy, like um, mm-hmm. 
Oh, like uh, I can't I can't remember any other the other series. There's tons of them though. Like um, I don't know. Like the classic one where it's like, yeah, it's just today, but there's also this like magical underworld. Well, doing like things. Percy Jackson. Yes. Yes. That. Yeah. That's it. Nice. It's, it's our world today, but also it's not. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Awesome. Cool. All right. Well, I'm glad. I'm glad that it does its job. I have to iron out some stuff in in there. I don't think I made a good pass for typos yet, but I'll have to. I'll have to keep working on that one. I'm pretty excited about that one. I actually have some ideas that I wrote down somewhere, but here's my trick. All right. Because I hate outlining. Right. I'll do outlining. Right. And then if I don't touch the story for like six months, I'll forget about it, right? And then I can actually start writing it again. <laughs> and I don't look at the outline, yeah. but I'll start writing, and it'll it, it's already up here, so it'll it'll just come out how I outlined it almost, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly. That's where I have this story. I actually wrote, so I do have a semi outline for it that I wrote. It was when I was in high school working at a restaurant, and you know that's a lot of repetitive work you know so yeah. it's nice because you can just do the work but your brain can be thinking of something else and so it was actually my notepad my serving notepad that this is all scribbled out on nice. and i found it when i was cleaning stuff out of my parents and I, was like, Shit, I had this whole like story in my hands <laughs> the whole yeah. time I'm like but i'm like do i want to use the outline or do i just want to look at how it starts and then go from there and trust my brain to fill in the gaps mm -hmm. I gotcha. Yeah, that's a tough one. I think I think I'm gonna. I think I'll figure out eventually the right the right methods for uh, making me an outline outlining be friends. Uh, I think I'll eventually get there. We'll see. <laughs> awesome. All right. Then I was curious. Um, I already wrote down a series of unfortunate events, but uh, any other book recommendations for me? Yes. Um. So there's this series. It's like. 15 or 16 books long, but it's called The Last Apprentice Series by Joseph Delaney. Oh, and I d we were both read reading those. those. Yeah, in a, okay. back in okay. the day. I, was like, I couldn't remember. I was like, I feel like someone else read them, but I couldn't remember if it was you or Cole that read them. He might have but, borrowed yeah. mine a couple of times. I can't remember. But yeah, The Last Apprentice, that one. So that was the first, like... Um, like I, I wouldn't call that story necessarily grim dark, but you know, like a darker. It's, it's pretty dark. I yeah. mean, he meets Satan incarnate at one point. Spoiler alert. Yeah, it, it, it really, it really throws me out. I think I finished. I think I finished all of. Yeah, because you're right. Because there's the first chunk, and then it, like, then they continue on somehow later on. He has another series or something like that. Or am I getting that mixed up? Yeah. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. So I think I, I yeah think he I did has he has like ones. a short spinoff or something like that. Gotcha. I actually might want to go back and read those again because that is actually that one was I won't, I completely forgot about that series. What a callback! Nice. Yeah, I need to actually finish it. I keep going on like spurts of like, oh, I'm gonna read the whole thing, and I read the first like twelve. There is one in the series that I don't have because I don't know why, but it's a highly sought after book. It's very rare. Like the only copies I've ever been able to find are like sixty dollars. Whoa. For yeah. this one book, and I'm like, what on earth? But so I think I've read the first like twelve or so, and I, it's always around October that I get. And I'm like, oh, spooky season, time to mm -hmm. you know read the spooky books, and then I just never follow through. I guess shocker. Gotcha. Nice. I'll actually have to have, have Debbie read that. I think she might like it. She likes some spooky stuff. Yeah, it's it's so good. It's and it it, it surprises me that it wasn't more popular than it was mm, mm -hmm. because you know you have like harry potter is well written yes but i would argue that the last apprentice series is more well written and has fewer plot holes and fewer you know <laughs> instances of teachers leaving kids in abusive situations um than <laughs> harry potter does <laughs> yeah yeah i definitely i think i'd probably agree with you like i'm rem I'm remembering back like it was just so good i think it's just purely like the tone and the subject matter like that's gonna be mm -hmm. a smaller niche and given that it's kind of like a ya ish kind of kind of novel series that you know parents aren't gonna want their kids reading books about <laughs> there's like people summoning satan and stuff but uh i think it's probably just because of what genre it is and the tone 
that it probably wasn't as popular because it was really well written. Mm-hmm. Yeah. In fact, there's a movie. Uh, Netflix has the first. Well, I oh. guess it's probably the only movie on it. Yeah. But it's called the movie is called The Seventh Son, and it's yeah I haven't watched it yet because I'm worried that it's going to be terrible. <laughs> yeah, but I gotcha. I'll have to I'll have to check I'll check that one out too. I vaguely remember like when I was in uh, seeing something about that on Reddit that there was a movie coming out, and then I completely forgot about it. Nice. Yeah. Solid. But yeah, so that would be the big one, and then there's this other one. I need to. I cannot remember. It's like, is it 32 cupboards or something like that? Maybe it's 32 mm-hmm. I don't know the name of it. Gotcha. I should have looked up the name of it. But I just remembered it earlier when you were talking about uh, urban fiction, which it's not urban fiction at all, but it's it's really good. The whole concept is there's this like kid that does he go stay with his grandparents or something? And there's all these like cabinets or whatnot. No, no, sorry. It's called the hundred cupboards. Mm, Showed mm-hmm. a few dozen, um, yeah, hundred sure. cupboards, and yeah. So there's all these cupboards, and they lead to these different worlds. But then some of the worlds are linked, and it's it's very it's kind of it's like you take Alice in Wonderland, you make it darker, and then you make it. I don't know. Alice in Wonderland is a great book. Don't get me wrong, mm, but it's mm-hmm. more intriguing. Gotcha. Okay. So, yeah, I'll have to check. I'll have to one. check that out for sure. That's kind of. I've got an idea. I haven't written anything about this one, but I want to be to like take just like steal every world that is um that's oh my gosh, what's the word for it? Public domain, right? All the worlds that are public domain mm-hmm. now, right? And they're all, you know, they're all shelved in a library in a public domain section. You know, I don't know why libraries, you know, organized. Um, and somehow somebody gets sucked into into the books or something, right? And they're traveling from like book to book to page to page to get to the end of the shelf oh, so they nice. can escape. I thought that'd be a good one. I'm not sure. There's yeah. a little bit of. Oh, I actually, I started reading this book. I don't think I finished it because it just wasn't my cup of tea. Um, they're by V. E. Schwab. Um, a darker shade of magic, I think. And in that one, mm-hmm. there's like four worlds, and they're all designated by different colors. But to like, but they're next to each other, right? So you can't go from like the black world to the white world. You have to go like black to red to gray to white, right? And you can oh, only travel in in between those in that direction. So it was, it was a, it's an interesting one for sure. Yeah, so we'll see. that's it. Kind of. Um... So these other ones you've probably read, you may have read already, but that just reminds me a lot of talking about like working with color and that. Have you read the Giver series, like the whole series? I have not. In fact, I haven't even read the book, I don't think. Yeah. The, yeah, the first one's really good. And then, so there's four books, I believe. I haven't read the last one, if I'm honest, but mm-hmm. it they all layer in on each other really well. And it's that one's really good. Um, gotcha. I'm always going to recommend Looking for Alaska by John Green. If you haven't read that, just for Alaska. John Green, isn't that the it's... guy that writes all the, all, all the tear jerkers? Yeah, he wrote oh, okay. uh, The Fault in Our Stars. Oh, yeah. okay, but, gotcha. Yeah, Looking right. for Alaska is really good. And then Hulu made a series, a mini series based on the book. And I thought they did pretty good. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, and then more classically, Fahrenheit, or not classically, yeah, classic ish, Fahrenheit 451. If you haven't read it, you need to read it because it is scary how much, how well, back whenever Ray Bradbury published it, he predicted Mm -hmm. the way things were going to go for our world today. It's scary. It's like, holy cow. Like, you can see it happening. And it's, yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, I have that that one on a list because I I remember, I think maybe it was read to me in a class somewhere or something somewhere, but I haven't actually read it. And so I've forgotten everything. So I'll have to read that one. Yeah. Oh, it's so good. And then Of Mice and Men is really good too. Yeah. That one's so short. And I only like it because of, there's some really good parallels in it, and I just yeah. Gotcha. I'll have to read. I'll have to read that one. There's there's a lot of these like classics that I always forget about, and then I'll be thinking I'm like, oh, I want to read a classic, and then I won't remember what any of them are. So <clears throat> good thing for me to actually write these down. Awesome. Sweet. Well, what I'd recommend for you, since you're not on the Brandon Sanderson hype train just yet, all right? Listen. <laughs> 
Uh, listen, I'm, I'm going to sell Brandon Sanderson to you here real quick. First off, you don't have to know anything about his books, right? This man, this actually, you probably, you probably, you probably heard about this, but during during COVID, he couldn't travel out and go to cons and stuff, right? And so he just mm-hmm. wrote more, right? And he hid it from everybody. He kept the same release schedule, and then he rele- he drops a video like two months ago. Is like, I have a terrible secret. Right, that's just the title of the video, and he released it. He's like, "So ah, I had some extra time," and he flaps a stack of papers. So I wrote a book. He's like, "Holy shit!" <laughs> because this guy write this guy writes so many books already. Like you're not you're never gonna have to worry about George R. R. Martin or Patrick Rothfussing his stuff. All right, this man is on a mission, and uh, mm-hmm. he's like, "So you know, I mean," and then I had, and he goes over and he has these 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 jokey diagrams on a chalkboard. And he's like. And so I wrote another book. <laughs> and this man wrote five extra books by accident. Holy cow. <laughs> that is amazing. That's the main selling point. But I'd recommend starting f- with him. Uh, I'd read uh, The Emperor's Soul. It's, uh, it's a novella of his. It won a Hugo Award. Um, and so it's shorter, and it'll really introduce you to his style. For a lot of his stuff, because he builds, like, his magic systems and everything tend to be very mechanical, right? They're not very much Lord of the Rings where it's like, yeah, Gandalf can do that because Gandalf, right? It's like, mm-hmm. he'll like, it, it, the magic powers or whatever they are, they come with a rule set. And so it's like problem solving with whatever powers or magic or rule set he comes up with. And uh, it's it's really interesting. And he's just, he's just got a really good style, so... Um. That reminds me, you should read, so this is by Rainbow Rowell. You don't have to read the kickoff book, which is Fangirl, because it's, the the premise of Fangirl is, it's this girl that goes to college and she's working on this huge fan fiction for, it's like, she's writing, it's essentially the parallel of Harry Potter, right? But it's yeah, called yeah. the Simon Snow books. And in this book, she's writing you know, her big fan fiction of what she thinks the last seventh book is going to be or whatnot. She's mm-hmm. trying to get it done before the author published, blah, 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 blah. But even without reading that book, you should read the actual. So then the author turned around and published three different Simon Snow oh. novels. And they're really good. And she, I really like the way she sets up her magic system because it's based on uh, our language and like popular phrases. Oh. So for example... Uh, I can't think of any examples from the book, but, like, slang that's popular in today's world, like, yeet, a few years back, mm-hmm. right, would have had a lot of power as a spell, because everyone was saying it all the time. Oh. Whereas older sayings, like, uh, I don't know, any 90s slang, wouldn't be as powerful anymore, because people aren't using it as much. Gotcha. That's, that's yeah. Sup- that's super cool. It reminds me, of re- I was reading, um... I think the series is called like the Hephaestus series. So it's it's like a it's like a the concept is that it's this it's like this little girl and she's like well not a little girl but you know like a coming coming of age YA story except instead of finding her mentor in the superhero, uh, she comes uh, mentor uh, gets mentored by a super villain, um, and so that's kind of Ooh, the concept. Nice. But there's a hero in the stories, uh, and one of her powers ends up ends up being that like she can like say like sayings or cliches or something like that, and it will do whatever like may would make sense to her <laughs> that would be associated <laughs> with and so she's like trying to do these creative things towards the end of the second book and it gets it gets pretty intense but that's a fun series i can't remember the name of it no i remember the first one was called hephaestus but i can't quite remember the rest of that but those are fun i'm a sucker for i was a sucker for superhero books for a big chunk there probably still am mm. they get me mm. <laughs> All right, there we go. Got that. Let me think. Was there another? Ooh, I actually just read this today in one sitting because it's actually really short. Uh, but it's uh, the Diaries of Adam and Eve, translated by Mark Twain. <laughs> 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 they are like, I haven't. This is actually like the first thing I think I've actually read of Mark Twain. But it's like supposedly the Diary of Adam and Eve, and he like you know the he, he kind of th- thought of it as like a like. A, if it was like just like a fable that had survived and like the concept of being the first person to ever do a thing and he like fleshes it out so it's like a a love story but it's i don't know it's it's super interesting because it'll be like eve will have like this three-page section 
for her journal, like Friday, Saturday, Sunday, rocking through things and different things she tried. She's very scientific in doing all of this. And then you'll turn the page and it'll be Adam's entry. Sunday. Pulled through. <laughs> just, yes. That's amazing. Yeah, I'll check that oh, out. Um, that great. reminds me. Have you read um, the Screw Tape Letters, C.S. I Lewis? I have read the Screw Tape Letters. Yeah. Okay. okay I was going to say, because I like that too. I like, and maybe it's just because, you know, I grew up with a very religious background. I love when books play off of biblical themes. It's probably very sacrilegious, honestly, but I don't know. I can separate fact from fiction, so yeah. I don't mind it. But mm -hmm. there's um, the Hush Hush series, too, deals with like angels and whatnot, or like the Mortal Instruments series talks about the, uh, the Nephilim. Is that, that's how you say it. Um, gotcha. But, you know, they take these ideas from the Bible and then they use that mm -hmm. to build whatever fantasy you know they're going off of and i love i love so yeah i'll have to check out uh that mark twain book because yeah i just mm -hmm. i think it's the most interesting thing definitely yeah i really want to read a like after reading like the afterword and stuff in this book i really got to read like a mark twain biography or something like hey you can go down to hannibal missouri i drive by it every time i visit my parents it's hey. pretty cool gotcha i'm have sure we'll have all of his now stuff there actually i wonder if that'll be so there's a this is well this is completely tertiary but there's a like i do the i do the lemons racing right where you get your 500 dollars car and you go racing mm. the same people mm -hmm. who manage that they do lemons rallies where you take a garbage or old or weird car and you do a like it's like a scavenger hunt on the road right so they plan out like a route and there's like these different places you stop and you get points for like you know you go there take a video or or a picture or something like that and you'll get points for the location or it'll be like, you know, we go we go to this diner, we hold a flapjack throwing contest. And, uh, but you roll all over the place and they're doing one from, they're doing one all the way up to Mississippi from New Orleans to St. Paul um, in November. So I'm going to, I think I'm going to try doing yeah. that one. And I wonder if that's like, I wouldn't be surprised if that was actually part of the route because they usually, it's all about like different like Americana spots that they put on the scavenger hunt usually. I'll check that yeah. out. Yeah. Yeah. Hannibal's really cool. Their street signs suck, but town cool. <laughs> um, nice. but you should read you should read Huckleberry Finn. That's I don't don't bother with Tom Sawyer in my opinion. I hate Tom Sawyer. I despise him. <laughs> but Huckleberry Finn is a good Mark Twain. Gotcha. I'll have to do that. Yeah, I definitely want to read some more Mark Twain after reading this one, and I want to reread um, Narnia and the Magician's Nephew. Um, yes. I, oh yeah. Uh, the, Apparently, the magician's nephew. My grandpa read that to me, and like I completely forgot about it until like a week ago when someone mentioned the magician's nephew, and I'm like, I feel like I've read that, and I was like, I haven't read that. My grandpa read that to me. Holy moly! Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Apparently, I think Disney Plus is supposed to be creating a Narnia series, and they're actually going to like commit and go through all the books. And so, as I, I should, re I'm rereading Lord of the Rings right now, but I want to reread Narnia this winter it's just a winter vibe yeah, kind of sure. book but yeah i love the magicians in fact on the train out to utah on our honeymoon ben was rereading the magician's nephew and i was finishing up the fellowship of the ring nice. and i was like "Ooh, can we can we just trade books can i like i i love <laughs> jr jr tolkien with my whole heart but i would much rather read c.s lewis because i got gotcha. yeah I feel I feel like I'm probably I'm probably there too. I definitely like just from what I remember. Like I read all the Narnia books when I, when I was a kid, but the like I've tried reading the Lord of the Rings through. I think I made it like halfway through Two Towers, and oh my goodness, I think I hit the the, the, the notorious slow patch that's right around there. I just mm -hmm. there's something. It's just it's. I read The Hobbit when I was when I was younger. I made it through because that one's like written for younger kids. I can still get through it, but there's something about his writing style that I just. It get it gets me like uh, like it's great writing right it's all fantastic prose it's a it's a really well built world like I can't fault any of the actual details here aside from the fact like you know he'll get to like the end of the Hobbit right Battle of Five Armies and so they all showed up and then there's like one paragraph describing this this epic conclusion yep and then like yep. the victory feast gets eight freaking pages all right exactly it's exactly. so annoying. <laughs> He spends more time describing the trees than he does describing the battle. Hey, because on, conveniently, me. conveniently, Bilbo conks out and is unconscious for the whole thing. Mm-hmm. 
Well, that's nice. Great for him. I wasn't unconscious. Let me know what happens. Oh, my goodness. Yep. Oh, gosh. I might actually, I think I've only seen the first or maybe the first of the Hobbit well, trilogy. Only reason I want to finish that is so that I can see the Battle of the Five Armies. That's fair. Yeah. And it's, <laughs> oh, gosh, I can't remember what it's called. But there's one of the rules in improv where if you hint at something, you have to see it happen. Mm, it's, mm -hmm. oh, gosh, there's a playwright. It's, is it Chekhov's gun? gun? You know, if there's a gun on stage, it has to be used at some point. Oh, yep. You know, if if you keep talking about that this thing is going to happen, you have to show the audience that mm -hmm. thing. You know, so if you're going to hint to us for an entire book that this big battle might ensue, you have to show us the battle. You can't just, yeah. Yeah, it's like, um, it's, oh, I, I watched, um, so Brandon, Brandon Sanderson teaches a class in BYU on writing science fiction and fantasy, and he has a lot of his lectures uploaded to his YouTube channel. And there's, and it, he keeps bringing up, it's, uh, it's promises and payoff, right? If you promise something, you either have to fulfill that promise or replace it with something better in the payoff, right? Mm -hmm. You can't just float this through here and not give it to me, man. Ugh. Exactly. But, yeah, I mean, I can't fault J.R.R. Tolkien for founding the entire genre of <laughs> fantasy. Yeah. Right. He, he didn't have time to write a battle. He was busy creating his own language, creating uh -huh. all of the lore, creating, yeah. <laughs> I, I really want to read uh, The Cimmerillion and, you know, figure out, you know. Mm -hmm. But I'm scared to read that because I feel like it's going to be a lot. But yeah. I'm mm -hmm. excited. I'm excited to watch Rings of Power. Oh yeah! We want to watch that sometime this mm -hmm. fall. Yep, I'm a, I'm pretty excited for that one too. But the um the Silmarillion, I got I got great with people who have read the Silmarillion, right? People who have read the Silmarillion, nobody enjoys reading the Silmarillion, right? People mm -hmm. read the Silmarillion so that they can say they've read the Silmarillion, right? right? <laughs> yeah, I hadn't even heard of it till high school. When I was talking about, I was talking about Lord of the Rings with someone, and Mr. Sam was like, well, have you read that? Because if you haven't read that, then you're not a true uh -huh. Lord of the Rings fan. And I was like, what? <laughs> and I went, and we had it in the library at Martin Luther, and I, like, was flipping through it. I'm like, this looks like the most boring thing in the world. Right? If I have to read this to be a true Lord of the Rings fan, then I don't want it. Like, It's, yeah, it's like, it's, it's just one of those things where, like, if you're super into it, it's something that you gotta push through and accomplish, Right. Like I, mm -hmm. I did it with one book. What was it called? Um, in hindsight, I actually did enjoy this book, but I didn't think I was going to when I started. It's called The Necronomicon by Neil Stevenson, and it is like this is this is this is very not politically correct, and I'm not using this in the right way. But this is the only way I know how to describe this book. It is autistic. All right, the book is like he'll get halfway through the book and he'll decide to take 34 pages and tell you how to build an atom bomb. Right? He'll like, he'll just get off on these weird tangents, and all the characters are supposed to be hyper-intelligent, and so they, they all feel autistic. Like, it's it's just really interesting. <laughs> well, that, that reminded me, I have to look up the name of this book. There's another really good book. I can't tell you why it's a good book, because <laughs> gotcha. you just have to read it. Okay. You just have okay. to trust me on this, but let me, I'll look it up. But, yeah, that's, I've read, I've. I'm someone that I'm like, oh, I have to like push through. I won't, um, you know, quit this book halfway, you know, and there's been some books where I'm like, I really should just quit this book halfway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I got you. But I actually did this Christmas. I decided something I wanted to do for Christmas. I wanted to read a bad romance novel, right? And so I went out looking for the worst mm -hmm. romance novel I could find, you know, this, and there's this, this author who writes books and it's like the niche of the niche of the niche it's a romance novel about werewolves who are also navy seals <laughs> and so they're called like the seal wolf series or something and she, she publishes all of all of these books and they're terrible romance novels and my goodness let me tell you if you if you, you're going in wanting to read one like that super enjoyable i gotta do one again next christmas <laughs> okay Speaking of romance novels, oh, did yeah. you ever want to just tackle a behemoth of American literature? That's also very controversial. You really, you should read Gone with the Wind. 
like given I liked it because it does have that like romance novel underlying tone to it but it's just so good it's such a it blows my mind how it's such a hefty book it's so long Mm -hmm. um but it's it's I don't know she does a great job of there's a bunch of characters but she writes them so well that it's easy to keep them separate like it's it blows my mind you know i've only read it through all the way once but even just going back and skimming sections of it just the way she structures it it's amazing gotcha all right yeah i'll have to check i'll have to check that one out for sure i think we're gonna have to do some book review episodes i've started doing book review episodes with tim because i've done so many episodes with him i think we're gonna have to do some book mm-hmm. review episodes absolutely it's gonna drive me nuts if I don't find the name of this <laughs> book. But I keep googling it in very vague terms, and yeah, I got gotcha. you. Oh, I've I think this is it. Before. Yeah, I think this is it. Uh-huh. A world without you, by oh, Beth Revis. That sounds like it. Gotcha. Okay, I'll have to check it out. Yep, yep, that's the one. A world without you. Okay, I'm gonna tell you this. Don't read the summary on the back because I didn't read the summary on the back before I read it, and I'm glad. I didn't because it mm-hmm. definitely spoils the whole book. Gotcha. <laughs> so, Roger that. I'll go and I'll go in blind on that one. Heck yeah. I'm a big fan yeah, of going in it's, blind. <laughs> it's so good. Awesome. All right, let me see. I didn't have any let me see. Did I have any questions here that I wanted to roll at? Oh, here we go. Last question that I had list, listed here. Um want to I wanted to ruminate about libraries versus buying books versus audiobooks all right because yes. my stance growing up because i grew up with my grandparents and my uncle and they're like hoarder level like my grandma ran estate sales but it wasn't because she wanted to run estate sales she just wanted everybody's junk and so it was her way to sneak in getting everybody's junk right and so i've always been very nervous about getting like hoarding books and i usually don't read books more than once right so i'm very i'm very nervous Mm -hmm. about actually buying books and so i've been getting stuff from the library but then you got to worry about like even if you're getting ebooks there's only a limited amount they have and um and so i've been doing audio books and i think at least i have been semi recently and for me there's this there's the nice nice thing one if i if i sit down and i'm reading a physical book I get so zoned into it, and I miss this a little bit when I'm doing audio audiobooks, but it's so much better for my relationships with anybody else in the world, right? Because if I'm sitting there reading a book, people can no longer just walk into a room and I'll hear what they say, right? This isn't going to work. I'm going to be pissed at people because uh, you made dinner now. I'm halfway through a chapter. I can't believe you've done this for me, right? And yeah. so with audiobooks, I don't quite have that, and it also slows down my reading. I, I read way too fast through a book. Like, I feel like, yeah, I barely got my money's worth out of it, but not with an audio book. It's sneaky. So I'm curious on, uh, on what your thoughts were for the different formats and stuff. Yeah. I mean, I'm always going to be a fan of libraries. I definitely owe a lot to the Truman Library because mm-hmm. I would go there. I was the kid, the stereotypical kid that would go in on monday and check out 15 chapter books and then come back on wednesday to return them and check out 15 more like the librarian there she was the best because you know there was like usually the rule of oh you can only check out eight books at a time or whatever she would always bend it for me and i would always get so mad on the days where i would go in and like she was gone and there was like a substitute in Mm -hmm. for her and the substitute was always like no you're not gonna like you need to let other people have those books. I'm like, I don't know how to explain to you that I will literally have these back two or three days from yeah. now. Just let me have the books. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that was great because, you know, especially I'm going to, I'm going to play the, the poor card. You know, we didn't have a lot of money growing up to mm-hmm. go buy all of those books, but my parents always like emphasize the importance of reading and they always read to us. It's like, yeah, I want a book. Um, and so the library was great for that. And mm-hmm. It's something where, like in St. George, I went to the library once, and it was to, it was to get, apparently out there I didn't have my copy of the Sorcerer's Stone, so I had to go to the library to borrow <laughs> from there. Um, but, yeah, so I think they're great. But on the other hand, I am a, an avid book collector. I call it a book collector, but you're you're probably right, it is book hoarding. I do hoard books. I have over 1,300 books 
Um, it's a problem. And I have, the worst part is, is I have duplicates. I have, I have (laughs) a soft cover set of the Harry Potter books and I'm working on, I think I have one full hardcover set and part of another one. (laughs) My goodness. What do I need them for? I don't know. And then Ben has his copies too. So we have four different sets of Harry Potter books. Why? I don't know. But <laughs> but yeah, so I have, so I like buying books so I can, I have them there anytime I want them. You know, I will, I will give myself this one grace. You know, a lot of them ended up in my classroom for my students to read mm. or whatnot. Um, so I like that. But yeah, I like collecting them. And because they they motivate me you know seeing all these books on my shelves i'm like okay no i need to write because i want you know i look at some of these books and even the ones that aren't so great motivate me because i'm like okay if that got published like (laughs) dude a hundred percent after after i read this crappy romance novel over christmas i was like brian why were you worried this is yeah and I'll like, exactly. I'll, or I'll scroll through Amazon and like, you can do like the self-publishing stuff on there. And I read a couple of ter- couple of terrible books. Oh, this is, this is, this is, this may, I don't know. I don't, I don't think it's necessarily embarrassing. It, it kind of is though. I think you go through to like the self-published stuff and there's like mm-hmm. genres of, um, it's just smut, right? It's just poorly, poorly written smut with what, whatever like world you want to be in. So like superhero smut, all these different kinds of smut. And I'm like, Brian, worst case scenario. <laughs> you can just start writing smut on Amazon and <laughs> like, <laughs> there you go. Right you there. found out the secret to an easy career. See? Just write Amazon smut. <laughs> exactly. All these parents like, Hey, listen, I know you want to be a basketball player, but your backup plan needs to be being an accountant. It doesn't. All right. Just write smut. That's all you need. Write exactly. smut on Amazon. Exactly. I love it. But uh, but yeah, awesome, cool beans. I like that. I like that. So I'm thinking, yeah. I'm thinking what my strategy's got to be because I like having like books that eat, that like are super important to me. Like having a copy of those, like The Emperor's Soul. Mm-hmm. That's one. Of, that's one of those I think I need to get a copy of. But I think the first time I read something, like unless I know it's like something that I'm really gonna want, I almost always do it in a different format because I'm just so worried about this ballooning collection of books. Ugh, it's gonna get yeah. Me, that's sneak fair. Up on me. Yeah, because I like I like to have one so that if I recommend it to someone, I can literally turn around and grab it off the shelf. Mm, mm-hmm. For sure. You know? And then I spend the next six months paranoid that I'm never going to get it back. But, <laughs> I but yeah, it's it. nice to be able to, you know, lend them out. And audiobooks are great. Um, they don't work well for me because I get too distracted. Like, I can't even sit and listen to a podcast. Oh, I got you. Doing something, you know. And so audiobooks, like my dad will listen when he's out for a run and he's, he's like, yeah, it's really great. And I, no, like I, uh, when I'm listening to an audiobook, I'm, I'm literally not <laughs> gotcha. book and all of a sudden something, yeah. But yep. I def, I def, I think they're a great, great tool. A lot of people. hundred percent. Awesome. All right. Well, I think we can probably call it there. This may be the longest podcast I've ever recorded because we nerded out hardcore. But uh... <laughs> I mean, I mean, I'm not known. I'm not known for mincing my words. That's mm-hmm. I do feel bad for my future readers and or especially my beta readers, because this novel that I'm working on is probably going to be well over 300,000 long. And yep. I, I am full aware that if it's that long, it has to be worth reading that many words. Mm-hmm. And I I hope it is, because, yeah. I gotcha. You know, I wouldn't worry about that too much with, uh, w- w- with a novel or something like that, necessarily. I think if you, you know... For a certain a certain kind of reader, they'll be like, "Hey, listen, man, I'm just I'm just getting more for my more bang for my buck here." So I think, yeah, I think exactly, exactly. Fine. They're right. They're like, "Oh, this huge book for this cost? Okay." Heck yeah! What? All right, awesome. Well, let me jump to recording. Oh, actually, a uh, thing at the end. What do I usually say at the end? Oh, yes. Uh, if you want to reach out uh, for the to me for any reason, Brian at NoLifeJackets.com is an email. Um, and all that good business, but yeah, cool. Peace.